So this is actually a really great opportunity because the, the talk that Miriam just gave really piggybacks into this nicely. Uh, my name is Bryce Mocker. Uh, I'm a data scientist by training. I've worked on both sides of the data science spectrum. So building ML facing products, recommendation engines, search, personalization, ad targeting, uh, you know, things like that. And then also the more business side of data science, predictive analytics, advanced analytics, you know, think about things like forecasting, customer segmentation. And one of the things that's interesting is we've spent a lot of time thinking about the ML ops infrastructure for those product features. They're the more ones to have a fully blown, reliable, resilient architecture for. But we haven't spent a lot of time thinking about the ML ops architecture for business facing models. And so that's what I want to spend time talking a little bit about today. Um, if we look at the impact of some of those business facing capabilities, Abilities. You know, for example, uh, McKinsey did a, a large survey and they said that businesses adopting AI, you know, which really big, big umbrella for machine learning, some advanced statistics, they can generate as much as $65 million in return on investment. Uh, that's a big chunk of change. I mean, even if we sit at the low end, right, if we only generate $27 million, you know, that's still, it's still a sizable amount of money that's generated by internal facing machine learning. The other piece of this is that businesses that use AI are five times more likely to realize significant financial benefits from that use case. But the problem is, is a lot of different places aren't able to get to that point. If you look at the commercial services world, finance is a little bit ahead of the curve, but you know, healthcare might be a little bit behind the curve. The ability to generate revenue is often blocked by machine learning and data scientists kind of getting stuck in the ether. If we look at the environments that a lot of kind of predictive analytics are done in, this probably looks pretty similar, right? You, you can squint and get the same picture everywhere you look, architectural diagram. We've got primary sources. These could be third-party data sources. It could be first-party event stream data moving in through orchestration, entering a very mature data platform that will come back to, gets pushed out to analytics layers, MarTech, uh, you know, executive reporting, things like that. Data science teams come in and they say, hey, I, I need to do some stuff here. I need to be able to have you know, multiple frameworks, multiple languages. I need compute. I need the ability to have a little bit of flexibility with installing packages and things like that. And what ends up happening is you get this kind of data science environment, ML ops platform, online, offline feed for happening way off on the side. I'm a big believer in Conway's law. Conway's law states that your architecture is always going to look a lot like the communication flows and culture of your organization. So when we're thinking about, man, these data scientists, they just can't generate value, or they just can't get in the, into the weeds with the rest of the org, part of it's reflected here in the way we build architecture for data scientists. They're kind of shoved off on the side doing their own thing in their own kind of monolithic world, daisy chaining you know, different services together and hoping at some point to push back into that data platform. That's kind of a problem. And that's what I want to my talk on today is how do we get those data scientists back into the world of impact? So the key that I want to push on is that data science that business facing predictive analytics is only successful, only going to get you that ROI as a part of a scalable data platform built to create high impact data products. That means pulling data science back into those platform teams. We're really focusing on that collaboration because at the end of the day, if we're thinking about that Conway's law and we're looking at that data science environment, it's a giant risk. It's not really integrated and it's not really built in order to build scalable data products. So I'm going to go through three factors, and we're going to dive into that data platform. We're going to talk a little bit about organizations, and we're going to talk about transferring data, data solutions into data products. So kicking off with that collaborative solution-oriented culture, let's go back to our diagram. So modern data platforms really mature at this point. They collect data, they clean data, it enriches, it transforms, it explores. And now we're kind of sticking AI here on the top. This isn't a hierarchy in terms of like AI is the piece that's at the top, but really about amount of maturity. Before you can move into AI, you gotta be able to collect some data, right? You have to nest it inside of a platform. It has to be manageable. You need to clean that up, you need to enrich. You're probably going to do some analytics on top of it. What the modern data platform has done really well, if you look, you know, for those of us who have been in the industry or if you talk to folks over the last decade, decade and a half, 
is that it's helped us re-engineer the relationship between all of our different teams, right? So in the Yale days, we had a platform team and a QA team, and they didn't know each other existed. They probably didn't shake hands ever. They didn't talk to each other. There was analytics engineering, which you know might be engineers, they might be analysts, but they're moving data around into each other. You've got analytics and reporting happening there, and that layer pushing information to teams, probably engaging with the MarTech stack. In the modern world where we have data platforms, these teams hang out together, right? They chat, they, they know each other exists, they're using common resources. But to that conversation about culture and the ways in which our infrastructures reflect those cultures, we might even see a little bit of siloing happen here, right? So QA and governance platform engineering might live in your tech org or your engineering org. Analytics engineering and analytics reporting could live in a data org. It could be in the tech org. It could be in the business itself and different business. You can have a distributed model where there's an analytics team for every p in your business. Then we've got the data and decision science team. Our architectural diagram with that random floating off group is typically the product of data and decision science not living in one place. It doesn't necessarily sit with the business organizations that analysts sit with. It doesn't necessarily sit in your tech or your engineering orgs. It kind of floats off onto its own. The problem with that is that always spin wheels in order to generate value. Cross-functional solution teams are 12 times more likely to generate ROI than isolated data science teams. And that's because a lot of the work that we do as data scientists are cross-functional. So if we come back to our diagram here, just kind of ignoring the, the technical limitations for a second, just talk about delivering a project like customer segmentation, we might have multiple different engineers collaborating together. We've got a MarTech engineer, we've got a product data engineer, we've got analysts in there, we've got data scientists working together to build this kind of capability. It's probably going to get deployed automated into reporting or into your MarTech stack. Revenue forecasting is the same idea. If you really want to deliver it well, you've got a large collaboration, people who know the data, people who know the business, people who know the methodologies. That's a very strong way to deliver projects, but often in the way of that is a, is a data platform shortcoming. So if we come back to our users in that data, platform. We've got our platform engineers, our QA and governance, our analytics engineers, our you know, analytics for reporting, and we've got our data and decision science folks. Now see, most of the stack can be supported through SQL and various infrastructure uh, as code languages. That's great. We're even getting to a point when you look at products like DBT, where analysts who know SQL can start to kind of get into the analytics engineering world a little bit, right? There's still some more complicating factors beyond just moving data around that analytics engineers and data engineers think about. But we're starting to democratize that through a single threaded language. When we get to the data and decision science teams, though, SQL's not really going to cut it for those teams. They need some flexibility for frameworks and languages, TensorFlow, Python, R, heaven forbid anybody's still working in MATLAB. They need really strong processing and flexible processing, things like uh, GPUs and CPUs. They need to scale up and scale down and they need to scale out in different ways in the platforms used to support it. And a lot of these predictive analytics teams are a little more shy on the engineering talent, a little stronger on the quantitative talent. So they're looking for some easy technology to help them do that work without having to completely build their own architecture. So what they do is they go out and they buy an ML platform. They, they, you know, they might build, half build one, but they, most of the time it's, it's about going out. We chop off the head there and we go to our little independent area. Now, the, the 2015 paper, the Google paper, all of the hidden technical debt is really about the connection pieces between here. Once you get this little thing on the side for an ML platform, all bets are off. You've got different integration connections, you've got different infra as code, none of it's being managed consistently, probably not even the same type of infra. Uh, and so this is where we get ourselves into trouble. The second problem with this is that these platforms are really for uh, what we early on called model-focused data science. If they're really great at building bespoke single one-time machine learning models. So think about your Jupyter notebooks as an example, like it's just like a proxy for things. Really great building one single model. Not so great moving to production. But these platforms had to mature in order to continue to meet the demand. They moved into doing things like quick visualization, data product launches. They started trying to handle version control uh, in a notebook environment 
it's already a nightmare. So you're adding in some more uh, fun with an independent platform. They started adding scheduling. These are kind of fancy cron jobs, right? It's not real orchestration. It's just kind of a, a scheduler. And then as you see on the bottom part of that, it's storage. This is, a, this is a governance nightmare happening here. Some data science platforms go so far as not actually have a direct link into data platforms. I've seen teams where they'll export a CSV out of this and then try and cram it into the data platform at some level beyond the raw layer. So we're, we're kind of, you know, we're getting work done. We're deploying things for this team. We're, we're trying to, to do stuff, but unfortunately we're doing it in a silo. And we're not actually able to for some of that work. So come back to our kind of uh, environment, our, our built-on data science environment. We, we see here that all of a sudden we've got this independent object. It's a ton of different, you know, regulatory, uh, security, uh, integration risks trying to correspond with the data platform. And like I mentioned, Unway's law, it's going to end the same way that the architecture looks, a little bit sloppy and a little bit complex. The problem is it's getting worse. Right, so if we go through here, you know, we, we've seen this for every vertical in the world, right? It's like everybody's got a new tool, we can integrate it on, we can just add it onto that data platform. But the result also slows down the data scientists. It's not just about like, uh, it's not clean code, it's not clean infrastructure. If we look at this flow developer survey, folks are spending 80% of their time just moving stuff around. Yes, you know, we all feature engineering, these are the important pieces of the data science workflow, but 80% of your time, and a lot of that's probably spent just moving from point A to point B. So moving into the data-centric world, this is really a philosophy that's, that's picked up a lot of steam over the last couple of years. Andrew Ng has, the, has a great site on data-centric AI. It's really about the consistency of the experience. So we have our data platform and we're actually leveraging it for as much as we can. You know, data scientists, I'm guilty of this. I'm sure some of the folks in here are guilty of this. You're like, oh, I'll just do it in Python when I get over there. Pushing as much of that into a SQL layer is brilliant, right? Because then you can start to do things like work with your primary domains, do your feature engineering, really kind of hammer away and use as much of that resource, that centralized data platform as possible. In this world, we still need a data science environment. It usually sits a little bit outside the platform, but it's constantly corresponding and, and talking back. You can stick your uh, model registry, for example, inside of a, a large service, and you can write those inferences from a business perspective back into the data platform. Now, this is a little more risky when we're talking about things like recommendation engines or live real-time, near real-time streaming inference. But for business processes that don't rely on having the information right there, it's actually a much better process to write that data right back into the data platform in you know, something you might call a future store as opposed to a feature store. The other nice thing about this approach is you can do what's called dark deploying models. So we're in the software world, we would canary deploy something. We'd let a little bit of traffic go there and then we'd eventually pile on more traffic as we saw it was successful. In the business world, we're not so much concerned with like scalability and the, and the load size typically. What we're more concerned about is the differences between models. So that black boxiness. So we can actually dark deploy models with this, have two models sitting in production that are, let's say, two different forecasts, and be able to evaluate the relationship between them in SQL within the data platform. Connect it to your favorite BI layer, and you can just automate your entire evaluation and transition of models over time. Where the world is going is to try and consume as much of that into a single data platform as possible. We're not there yet by any measure. Nobody would, would say that I can just shove it all in one place. But the idea is eventually ever live inside that platform. You can build that community around delivering data products rather than just delivering data. And shameless plug, that's honestly the philosophy behind Snowflake, right? as we build out a product, as we think about horizontal technologies, we're thinking about those vertical needs, such as data science, in order to integrate a clean, easy, resilient uh, data platform. So the final piece of this, once we get a nice, a nice culture going, we've got a great infrastructure, is to start thinking about data products. So this is one of my, one of my favorite quotes. I, I keep this around. Um, 
because it just demonstrates exactly what stakeholders want from data scientists who are working on the business side. They want to know what was the impact. They're not interested in technology. They're not interested in how you did it, why you did it. They just want to know the impact and that it's resilient and sustainable. So three principles for value-centric data science products. Method and technology matter insofar as it's measured by speed, impact, and extensibility. So we'll, we'll come back and walk through these. Speed is measured by adoption, code completion. That cultural work of AI, quote unquote, is the hardest piece. And then finally, transforming solutions into data products sustain that success, so creating automation, creating infrastructure to automate impact. But it also buys you runway for innovation. None of us have ever delivered one model, left it in production, and hoped it stayed relevant for you know, years, I hope. So having that first data product, getting people onboarded, getting them invested and adopted means that you have that runway to start experimenting with more complex model methods. Boost that accuracy. Can you do things like reduce the variance? So on the tool front, I, I think this actually gets us into an interesting area to talk about the relationship between auto machine learning or auto ML and value-centric DS products. Had you talked to me like, you know, four years ago, five years ago, I'd been like, auto ML here, right? Like we, we'd rather build it, it's more transparent, we can do it well. That space has really matured in some interesting ways for some methods and methodologies. And so I think auto, auto, auto ML can, not always, but can actually be a really great accelerator to getting you to that value add. Why? Well, because AutoML has a couple of value propositions and, and a couple of things that it can do. On the business side, if you've got a great AutoML model, it delivers the impact that you need. You've got the transparency that you need for the use case. You get your quick value add, right? These AutoML models, it's fit, predict, move on with life, right? So you can get that quick value add. And, and really, you're going for quick value add, not most value add right away. And we'll talk about that in a second. Second, the reason why you see a lot of engineering teams moving into the advanced analytics space with these auto ML tools isn't because they don't think you're brilliant as statisticians, as mathematicians, as data folks. It's because the output of that is really consistent, always, right? It's an API. It just spits out the same array at the same, you know, same parameters that it always spits out at. So that consistency in AutoML really sets a good cookie cutter and template for you to engage in that work. Impact over complexity, transparency over perfection, these are really good tenets that actually are boosted by the AutoML kind of process. Because what you can do is you can stop paying attention to things like writing the uh, simple code or the more complex code for your big models. Really think about that use case. Step back and use your brain power in other ways. And then finally, like I mentioned, building trust is how you build runway. So 50% say using AI, uh, businesses use AI say that adoption is the biggest barrier to return on investment. So that cultural work is the biggest piece that we can really focus on. And say that more support understanding AI use cases would remove this. So these are our first two tenets, right? If we quick impact, and then we can sit and help the business understand how to use it, how to adopt it, that's a win. That buys us the runway then to go and explore, you know, more that approaches to segmentation to think about more edge uh, ML use cases. And then finally, as I was mentioning, the focus needs to be eventually on building products. So data solutions, data science solutions solve a problem. That's the thing you can do reliably over and over again, even if you are just hitting shift enter down your Jupyter notebook. But products are sustainable, they're scalable, and they're usable. And this great image, uh, I, I've taken some liberty from a, a data product manager uh, named John Swan. And there are three types of data products that data scientists can build. There's APIs. These are you know, in collaboration with our data platform folks who probably have a really great template for APIs as code, terraformed up and ready to rock and roll. But these are ways to output data. It's just simply, you know, how to get consume data, standardized definition. You can build reports, dashboards for models. These are things like forecasts, right? Forecast today, tell me what next year's revenue is going to be. And then retrain that forecast regularly and tell me what the shift up and down has been. Is that error or is that we're doing an awesome shift? 
Those are things that you can deliver to stakeholders and help them have those conversations, delivering that impact. And then finally, the third data product that data scientists build are capabilities. These are things that might actually automate full work, or workflows. These are things like targeting users or targeting a segment, activating users, firing messages uh, that'll encourage a user to do another thing. So on that note, I will actually close off and put that slide up for the, uh, the three, three plays I'd suggested. And I'm happy to take questions if we have time.